licking buffalo dung and eating buffalo dung and, and after a bit of research we found out that they're doing it uh, to get uh, gut flora bacteria to aid with digestion so buffalo dung is indeed interesting you probably just don't want to delve too deep into it because it's quite squishy okay now we're gonna just have a quick look around treehouse waterhole No sign of anything yet. I'm hoping those lion tracks are going to pop out somewhere here. But alas, not yet. And I'm starting to wonder how we're gonna oh Desmond you ready for a challenge oh quickly there's a falcon there's a falcon you got it there a tiny little falcon there I'm a falcon look at it go there we go. Beautiful little falcons. Now they migrate in there hundreds of thousands to South Africa. There's only one there, but if you look carefully, they quite often will find a few more. Off he disappears. And uh, they are insectivorous falcons. And, and they literally travel around looking for emergences of insects, specifically uh, flying ants or termites, and you have nesting sites in South Africa where you can have 50 or 60,000 of those little falcons nesting in one spot, and it is absolutely incredible. And they travel from uh, sort of north of India, Pakistan, all the way to South Africa for the summer. Okay, we're going to continue on and see what else we can find while we do that. I wonder what madness is happening in the tent. <laughs> there is no madness in the tent. Everyone is quite sane here. <laughs> but what we have here is the other myriapod that I was telling about a little bit earlier. There is a proper millipede with many, many feet. Not a thousand, because millipede does mean thousand foot, but they don't have thousands of feet. And what I will do is show you him under the microscope, because he looks rather special. He's uh, in the same box as the pill millipede, so you can see the pill millipede there. <gasps> Look at this. There, he's just starting to wake up. Can you see that? There, his legs just starting to wake up. And he's adopted this position in the same for, for the same reason that the pill millipede adopted his. He's extremely terrified of me. And you can just see that little antenna starting to form. Sorry about that. There we go. That is crystalline sharp. Little claws, little hairs to help it walk up and down some vertical surfaces. And eventually he will gather the confidence, open up, and hopefully crawl off. To survival. I think that's a really, really nice shot of the millipede. Isn't that marvellous? Now, we have another special, special thing here. Let's have a look at the drone. And there is Stefan Winterboer's <laughs> rain bivouac. Very nice. And now, I don't see any flames or smoke there, which is a bit sad. You can see Jean Dre there. He is um, trying to film, I think. Ooh, may there we go, there's fire. Good grief, that's wonderful. And in the background, Herbert, he is looking out for things that might be a threat to both Steph and Jean Dre, and indeed himself. But doesn't that look like fun? I think that looks like tremendous fun. And I know Steph, who has a five-year-old son, he would love to be doing that with his little boy. And I've no doubt his little boy would enjoy it too. They've got a gorgeous tree for shade. And they've got a fire. And they've hopefully got something to eat. And let's go and find out if they do. As you can see, I got my fire going literally just after you left us on the last time. A little bit more huffing and puffing and I managed to get a flame going and then using some zebra wood, which is all the wood that I'm using at the moment, I managed to build myself a fire and on that fire I've managed to boil myself some water 
and we're just waiting for the final little touches to go onto some water inside my mug. I'm holding it because I don't have a stand, so I'm busy losing all the hair on my hands. But nevertheless, we will get this water boiled and then I'm gonna make Jandre a very happy man. But while we do that, why don't we play a little game that we've got for you to play. It is called Two Truths and a Lie. Quite obviously I'm going to tell you two truths and then I'm going to tell you a lie. And my topic for this while we've got a fire and this fantastic little camp that we've busy built for you ourselves over here is bush food. So here we go. Here's my first point. Um, I'm going to say that uh, termites offer a more nutritious meal than an impala. That's my first point. My second point is Mupani worms, and I highly recommend you go and see what a Mupani worm is, are safe to eat. And then I'm going to say my third point, that scorpions should always be eaten whole out here when you're eating them as bush food. Alright, now what do you do with these three things? You choose which one you think is the lie, and then you send it, either fact one, fact two, or fact three, to the hashtag Safari Live, and I'll share which one was the lie. So let me just go over that again. Fact one, that termites offer more nutritious meal than impala. Fact two, that mopani worms are safe to eat. And fact three, that you should always eat scorpions whole out here as a bush food. Alright, hashtag Safari Live. Fact one, fact two, fact three. Now I think the coffee, oh, oh no, I ruined my surprise. I packed in a nice mug of coffee here. I knew that we were gonna be practicing our rain set today, or our rain set up today. And so what I did was I packed in a mug with some coffee. Ah, what could be better than Let's just get ourselves a stick here to stir it with. Any stick will do. Although I suppose you don't want one with too much sand on it. Yes! Nice cup of coffee in a steel mug. Warm up the hands. Ah, I don't think there's much better. Have a look. I didn't pack any milk in, unfortunately. It's just gonna have to be black trail coffee, really. Ah, yes. Now, Rashida, while we're sitting here waiting for my cup of molten lava to cool down, you've asked me a nice question in that, um, you've asked me, does the smoke from the fire bother the animals? Uh, Rashida, no, not in my experience at all. I haven't noticed that fire does anything to animals. And I think it's because fire is so much part of the environment out here. Fire and rain and storms, flood and drought are all part of what these animals deal with on a year on year, decade on decade, basis and so no fire and smoke don't bother animals whatsoever in actual fact I've seen animals literally move behind fire and go on to ash to go and eat ash and, and you know the, the coals are still warm and then grasses sort of sprout up within 24 to 48 hours after being burnt in some areas depending on the amount of rain that's been falling and so no I, you know in my experience at least anyway fires haven't done or smoke doesn't bother the animals at all there's an old wives tale of course I was told once when I was a young boy you mustn't make fires in the bush like this because rhinoceros would love to come they the firemen of the bush and they would love to come and stomp out fires so they'd come rushing in out of the darkness and stomp your fire to death um, it was only years later that I watched a movie by a director called Jamie Ace called uh, I think it's funny people Oh, gods, sorry, gods must be crazy. Yes, gods must be crazy. And this rhino, albeit a plastic mechanized one, I think with two people inside of it, came running out of the darkness to stamp on the fire. And so I think that's where this old wives' tale or myth or fable uh, found itself some, some footing. But no, I haven't seen rhino step out uh, any fires out here. I've even had a lioness eat my dinner off of a fire once. Um, I was on a camp once, sleeping in a riverbed, and this lioness came down off the side of a rock, right next to us. We moved away from the fire, she moved to the fire. I had a big piece of meat cooking on a, on a skillet, and, uh, and she literally put her face into the fire and ate my meat off of my grid. 
And uh, yeah, that's that. So the myth that lions are scared of fire is it's a myth that rhinoceros are firemen is a myth. So no, they don't do too much. I must be honest with you, sitting over here on this stump is very pleasing. And with some coffee in my hands, it is absolutely pleasurable. Now, Janet, you've asked me if, uh, or you've actually made a comment, you've said that a, a baboon's tail can be used as a fire starter. Um, I would literally say no, because baboon's tails, oh, to transport fire, baboon's tail can, you, can be used to transport fire. I presume you're meaning the plant, a bushman's tail, not the actual bushman's tail. That's actually a good question. I've never transported fire with a bushman's tail. I will give it, hold, hold on. Baboon's tail bush, there we go. So Kirsty's just let me know that it's the baboon's tail bush, not the actual baboon's tail. <laughs> um, no, I haven't actually heard of that before at all. But I, I, I mean, I presume it could be. It's fairly densely packed. It's got all fibrousy bark. I mean, I can't see why it couldn't hold a coal. So I think there's some merit in that. Why don't I tell you, watch over the next couple of weeks and months, I'll pick myself a nice dry bushman's tail once, put it in my backpack, and when next we make a fire like this, I'll see if I can transport the coal in some means or another. Excuse me looking down and away from me, jean -Dres about to set himself alight here. He's crawled on top of this fire. His pants have started to smoke quite alarmingly. I've decided that I'm not going to drink my coffee yet. I'm going to use it as a fire extinguisher if I need to. <laughs> this is cold enough now to drink and I think I'm going to do that. Yes. Ah, I even put some sugar in so it's even better. It's not just this bitter black coffee. Now, I must be on. I've been looking at what modifications I can make to my tent and I think I'd bring the sides down a little bit. Now Debbie, you've asked me what we can use for sugar in the bush. Debbie, there's not much here that gives you that sweet, that gives you that sweet kick, that, uh, that sugar as we know it would. But you can use the gum from an acacia. You can also use the gum from a leadwood to sweeten up uh, things. So I would look for gum from an acacia or gum from a leadwood, a combretum in burby tree, and that I would drop into my coffee in a heartbeat. And that should sweeten it up. Not as much as sugar, but it should sweeten it up absolutely. Mm. There is honey here as well. Now, some of you are going to be going off for a break soon. When you come back and don't go anywhere, we're going to be looking at exactly what modifications I'm going to make to this campsite. Now, what modifications would you do, I think is the question that I, that I asked over there. I think it depends on really what direction the weather comes in from. This is a design, these tops are of course massively dynamic in that you could basically generate any, any, any feature. I don't think I'd actually make a modification to it, I think I'd actually change the design to be honest with you and make it a, one, a, a bit more of a rain shelter rather than just a place that you can sit out of the weather from. Anyway, while I finish my coffee and enjoy the fire, why don't we go see what one of the others are up to. I think it sounds as though Steph is having an amazing time in his tent with his coffee. Brian, that's what we should have done this afternoon. Yeah, yeah um, we should have we should have brought coffee along for the ride, stopped and had a quick coffee break. Oh, that being said, um, the weather has just closed in and I think that Steph is going to be very glad of his tent in the not too distant future. And I think because the weather's coming from the southeast, it's going to hit Cheetah Plains first and all of a sudden it went from almost sunny to not at all with dark clouds threatening and I think that the animals in this area know something that we don't. There's definitely rain on that horizon. And I think I think we're going to be very very grateful for our roof in a moment. It's on its way. I'm not sure if it's going to hit Juma but we're going to try and stay ahead of it for now and start making our way back in the general direction of Juma. It's actually astounding how quiet it is out here. Everything is hiding except that luckily we've got those really quiet breaks to make a really subtle stop. Hello little Stembok. Aren't you gorgeous? <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> well, there we go. She's actually relaxed a little bit. Oh! 
and now she's going to lie down. How marvellous. Yes, beautiful girl, we're talking about you. I think that you started off with a little steenbok a little bit earlier on the Sunset Safari, but this, I've noticed this about the steenbok in Cheetah Plains in particular, that they seem to be slightly more relaxed with our presence than the ones on Juma. I have absolutely no idea why that might be, but it does seem to be the case. And look at this. I don't think if she, I don't know if she's realised, she must have realised that we've seen her, but she just feels comfortable enough with us to settle down. You can see those massive ears of hers pointing in every direction. You can, patchy skin around her eyes and her ears, and she might have at some point had a problem with mange, and we've noticed it with a lot of the antelope species as well. As they've come through this drought, many of them have suffered from a mange infestation, and those little mites that infest their skin. And it's something that she seems this rain will certainly um, be of a huge help for all of the different antelope species, just in terms, or all of the animal species, just in terms of helping them get rid of that. And you can see she is accompanied by lots and lots of flies. Very rapid breathing. She's ruminating at least, so she seems to be absolutely fine. Hello, girl. This is a very typical posture of the various antelope. Being able to move their ears in independent directions means that she can keep a very close eye on us and at the same time listen to anything that might be sneaking up behind her. So that's exactly what she's doing now, although it is giving her a very anxious expression. <laughs> Who, me? No, it wasn't me. She looks at, She looks an interesting combination of slightly guilty and slightly anxious. <laughs> Sweet. And James, lovely question. He wants to know if a steenbok will only establish a territory once they have found a mate. And James, yes, um, only when they find a mate will they actually settle down and establish a territory as far as I know. Um, what might happen is that maybe males will start to sort of be in an area. One male might be in an area and then the female might come and join him. Um, but generally it's only when they have established their own mating pair that they will start to defend a territory. And of course with these little steenbok, males will defend their territories against other males and females against other females. And that is the way in which they, they manage defending their territories. And if a male encounters another female, he might actually just mate with her. Welcome back to our television audiences. You are on a live safari from the heart of a Cheetah Plains Game Reserve in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. My name is Jamie and the reason you were staring at a bush was that there was up until five seconds ago an antelope lying right down there. I don't know where she's gone. That is the joys of live wildlife filming. If you ever needed any proof that this is live, um, she's vanished. It was a little steenbok, one of the smallest antelope that we have, and she lay there so nicely for us uh, right up until the point that you all rejoined us. It is just par for the course. Sometimes it's birds flying away, sometimes it's antelope running away. It's something that we've <laughs> we've come to accept as a certain inevitability. Luckily it's just it's not just us out here. And I'm sure you're all wondering what's happening in the comfortable tent. Let's head over to James and find out. It is amazing how as the um, as the weather gets worse, the sort of longing references to my comfortable tent become more and more vociferous. When the weather is fine and there are leopards and lions, you hear nothing about how lucky I am to be in the tent here, but right now you do. And we're going to show you from the air why it is that I'm feeling, no, we're not quite yet. Let's have a look rather at what's going on here under the microscope. That is the back end, the business end, of a spider hunting wasp. And that is probably the sting sticking out of its bottom there. 
the ovipositor. This one is, of course, quite dead. And I found it right now. We're just going to slide up as we go there. And this spider hunting wasp is the bane of the existence of the poor and hapless baboon spider. This horrid, horrid creature. And I'm obviously being quite nasty about it. Let me just try and change the exposure slightly. There we go. Now we might get a slightly better view there of its face. No, that's an absolute disaster. There we are. Anyway, you can get an idea there. Sorry about that. So well, this thing hunts spiders, of course. We've told you that a number of times. It's very seldom that they are around. Now, the reason I'm so comfortable in the tent here, you're about to see. Look at the cloud coming in. That there, I believe, is the western horizon that we're looking at now, but Connor is going to turn and show you the burgeoning grey clouds coming in from the south and the east. That's north, and there as he swings towards the east, Jamie is underneath that very greyest part there, and that section there is coming in towards us, and I think there, right where you're looking now, it is actually raining. So, Steph is going to be very pleased for his tent just now, I'm sure. Uh, I'm certainly very pleased for mine. Jamie will be pleased for her roof. Brent will look like a drowned rat not very long from now, which I think is quite amusing, really. Isn't that gorgeous? That is just a wonderful view of the weather coming in. I love that drone. I think it's one of my new favourite things. Then... I'm just quickly, of course, there's so much rain, there has been so much moisture during the day, and that means so many things have come out. One of them is this quite astonishing stick insect. Now, we will just try and get a nice picture of him. Oh, look. <laughs> look at the stick insect. Look at his eyes. His eyes are not those two black things. Those are just the roots that his antenna are coming out of. His eyes are just behind those sort of blotchy amber things there actually looking at us. You can see them moving. Isn't that cool? And we go down his body. And he does look like a stick. He's probably not the stickiest stick insect I've ever seen. He's more sort of a barkish stick insect, but he is magnificent nevertheless. I say he, of course, could easily be Mrs. Stick Insect. Now this one is about, oh, probably just over an inch long. So one last look at the antenna, and I'll pull him out of this jar, and you can have a look at him there. Quite special, really. And none of this happens, of course, without rain. And we're probably going to have some more rain now. And I think that when the next sun comes out, we're going to have a great swathe of these things. Isn't he cool? And we'll release him too. He doesn't like living on my hand. Why would he? I think that's marvellous. Now, apparently, everybody is currently putting on their rain covers. Now, let's. what I want to do quickly is just go outside with Dave. We'll put Mr. Stick Insect back and show you how much darker it's got suddenly. Oh, it's actually started raining immediately. Over there... You can see the grey clouds coming in from the east. That is the easterly direction as we swing around towards the south. Steph is over there. It's now raining. Zombie car, I will answer your question. I'm just going to move the stuff in here. Zombie car, you're wondering if animals are going to come back here now. Well, they didn't... Uh... <laughs> I, I know what you mean. Okay, so we've had this huge plethora of animals of late. Please excuse me, I must just bring this in. Um, yeah, no, um, to be short, no. I think it's unlikely. Because it's raining everywhere now, it means the animals are going to be dissipated probably for the next few months. In fact, probably for the next three or four months. They're going to be dissipated around all the good spots if we go into another drought and perhaps we have uh, good rains here and only the dams here fill up and only the clearings here fill with grass, then it will probably it's possible that the animals will come back here. But I think that sort of boon time that we've had with all the animals is uh, well and truly over, as you have guessed, because there's rain everywhere. 
It's not the best blessing for us, but it is an absolute blessing to Africa. Let's head straight across to Steph and find out how he is preparing for the rain. Alrighty, now you wanted to know exactly what type of modifications we were going to make to our shelter to get it ready for a rainstorm and believe it or not, it actually did rain. This is about the most uh, rainproof or stormproof shelter that I can build. Um, and the reason for that is that it's got this closed door. You can actually shut the door. You can bring the door on the inside and tie it up. You can shut it on the outside. But basically, you can keep it closed. Now, I'm missing a few modifications because I still need to do some, some, some changes to it. But come and have a look inside here. You can see that it is actually fairly spacious. Quite easily spacious enough for me. And I'll show you when I get inside here. There we go. There we go. So very big, much bigger, big enough, and I can close the door, completely shut out the weather, and even tie it down if I need to. Ah, there are a few changes that I need to make, of course. These things are never ever perfect, but. I consider what I'm going to do over there. Why don't I give you the answers to that two truths that we've done? Now, 11% uh, of you said it was fact number one. 31% of you said that it was fact number two. Sorry. Th sorry, fact two was 11, fact one was 31, and then we had over 50% of you said it was fact three. And that was in, in fact true. So for those of you who decided on fact three, which was scorpion should always be eaten whole as the lie, you were 100% right. That was the lie. Scorpions should always have their tail and the last two segments. So the sting, the last two segments of their tail, pulled off, preferably with a stick, not with their hands, and then the scorpion can be roasted. I wouldn't put the scorpion just without cooking it in a fire in my mouth I would roast that scorpion and the rest of the scorpion can be eaten whole down your down your mouth and offers quite a lot of very nutritious food all right now I think what we go and do is while I'm busy packing up over here and we get ourselves out of this weather we send you over to Brent for an update Well, the pressure dropped, the wind picked up, and we started getting a few specks of rain, so we've put on the trusty rain covers. We're going to keep on searching. Uh, I think it's getting towards that time of the day where that male lion that I think is very close to camp is might get moving. So I'm just doing a slow, big loop back down towards that area, and hopefully he'll be on the move. Those of you who watched the Juma Dam cam, please keep an eye. He might pop out there. But so far, a few impala, and the odd steenbok, and the odd bird. But here we go, there it comes. A bit more rain coming through now. Very, very light sort of drizzle. It's almost like you're driving through the mist. So, if we get another good soak over the night, it's going to be really good for the soil. Brayden, who's five years old, and Brayden would like to know, how can I tell the difference between cat tracks, and how do I know if it's a lion or a leopard? Well, firstly, Brayden, I look at the size. Lions are as big as my hand, a big male lion, where there's a big male leopard will be the same size as the inside of my hand. Now, of course, with lion cubs, they can be the same size. They're slightly different shape. Leopards, seem, for me, and I, I, I never got taught sort of taught tracking in a specific way. Uh, when I got taught, I just got told, that's a leopard, that's a lion, remember, and I have. So the best way I can explain it is le lion tracks are generally slightly more elongated, so they're a little bit longer, and uh, leopard tracks are sort of fatter and squatter. But also, it's very seldom you're gonna find a lot of le leopards walking together, so that almost always means lions, uh, especially when you've got the small cub tracks that you might get confused with. Ooh, is this going to get harder? I don't know. Well, we'll wait and see. So I'm going to start moving back towards Juma where that male lion is somewhere. And hopefully, 
and we're going to be able to find him. Maybe the rain will get him moving. Oof. Now, none of us out here are particularly sane, but the person who's probably the least sane that we have to put him in a tent from time to time just to calm him down is James, so let's go see what he's up to. You see, you see what I mean? They are, so, blah, 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 they are so very jealous of me and my lovely tent here. Anyway, we're probably going to have to close up soon. It's starting to get a little inclement outside. Now, before we go across to the next uh, small break that we're going to take, I'm going to show you three things. Two of them are the same as each other, so in actual fact, it's probably more two things than three things. Over here, we have got two eggies. They are the eggs of the Natal Franklin, and they were found by Brent Lear Smith the other day when he was on a walk, and they nest seem to have been abandoned, and unfortunately, if I shake one, it uh, doesn't sound like a normal egg, it sounds like there could be a corpse inside. This one sounds completely solid. Now, we're going to open them up at some stage. I don't want to do it just yet. Of course, we do have a TV show coming up. Well, this is a TV show, sort of pretend TV show. We have a sort of not pretend TV show coming up at the end of the week. Next, yes, this week on Thursday, 4 o'clock our time, so you can work out what time that is for you, and I think I'll probably open them up then, just to find out what's inside. We probably won't do it live, because I think it will probably be a little bit, uh, well, it could be a little gruesome and gooey, so we won't open them up until then. We'll place them very carefully in this Tupperware, and hopefully they will survive there. Now, there was something else of vital importance I had to tell you. I found something, and now... It seems to have crawled away or gone. Never mind. Okay, let us have a... Ooh, the thunder is rolling in. Right, we are going to go over to a short break, but before we do that, let's have a look at these mushrooms. They came up probably last night. After the rain, they're growing in some rotting Terminale Cerisia wood, and they were surrounded also by termites. These were built by termites here, and I think you'll find that the termites may well have seeded the wood with the fungus and they will eat this fungus in order to digest the food that they eat. So, of course, most animals don't have the capability to digest cellulose and termites are one of those animals, so they grow the fungus in order that they might eat the fungus that has eaten what they like to eat, if you know what I mean. And that's just a rather clever way of making sure that there is sufficient now, we're going to go to a short break. Brent is still looking for the lion. Steph is about to drown. And Jamie is on her way back. We'll see you shortly. All right, we're back with the internet, everybody. Of course, you are the same people who've been watching us the whole afternoon, and it is wonderful having you here with us. Now, I showed this to you during the course of the morning, and what I'd quite like to do now is kind of break it up a bit. And let's just see what's in here. And what you can see, the wood is very soft. It's breaking up quite nice and easily. There we go. And I, look, I don't know if it's actually true or not that this was planted by termites. We know that many termites grow fungus, many ants grow fungus as well, and they're totally unrelated, of course, ants and termites. Let me get that out of your way, David. Fuel. Fuel, yeah. And uh, there's now water blowing in through the window, which is quite interesting. But it's totally rotten. And, I mean, oh, I don't know, fungus is a difficult one. They're not very easy to identify, of course, but look how pretty that one is there. Isn't that lovely? Gorgeous purple colour, and we'll have a look at it under the microscope now. And as I was saying, of course, so many animals grow fungus because they lack the digestive enzymes to digest plant cell wall material. Now that sounds like a slightly boring microbiology lesson, but it is an important one. Plants, of course, don't have bones in their bodies. They don't have exo or endo endoskeletons. And that means that they have to have some kind of structural material 
There we go, that's the fungus on top. They have got to have some kind of structural material in the cell wall in order to keep them upright, to keep them stiff. So if you think about the grass culm or the stalk of a grass, well, that's filled with cellulose. And there is no animal or very, very few animals in the world able to produce the enzyme cellulase that can bring or harness, for example, the nutrients that come in cellulose. And one of the things it can is a fungus. And so many ants, many termites will in fact grow fungus in order to digest plant material. Steph, I think, is probably going to be having a tough time of it fairly soon. And I'm quite keen to find out how he's going to deal with that. Well, normally I just say let's camp out underneath that rain tarp, but it, this rain is sort of coming in gusts and coming in blows and it's giving us a bit of time to make a little bit of distance, make a little bit of distance. So we'll slowly creep home and we won't have to spend the night out here. I'll send the drone back to come and find us at least anyway. Let's get, the, I don't know if you saw when you were watching uh, that drone or well, that drone shot that you had with us um, just now. I don't know if you saw that we were like in the middle of this block, somewhere between Philemon's cut line and tree house dam it's just such a nice block there's a lot of things going on here on the western on the eastern side of the block there's some big termite mounds but on the um on the let me just get my directions on the eastern side big termite mounds on the western side they've got these funny thickets with these drainage lines it offers such a nice diversity of um of different habitats and at the same time also nice plant communities and with it comes its associated birds and small mammals and obviously insects my favorite um, you might get a little bit up and down over there, it's just Jandre trying to step over all of these plants and things. Now Tina, all the way from Canada, you've asked me, are there ladybugs out here? There absolutely are ladybugs out here, Tina. And there's also one of my favorite beetles here as well, the tortoise beetle. So wherever you're sitting at the moment, go and have a look at the tortoise beetles. They, just like ladybugs, are some of my favorites out here. Um, they do get preyed upon out here, so they're not quite as prolific as what you'd find say in your mom's rose garden or in a rose garden anything like that i know my gran had this massive rose garden i played in there lost lots of soccer balls to the thorns inside that garden they're not quite as prolific as what um as what they would be in a cultivated garden but you definitely find them out here absolutely i just wanted to have a look at what this was for no apparent reason there's this mound of sawdust and I thought at first I thought that it was actually a puff ball fungus but I'm not so sure anymore that to me is sawdust and the only thing that makes sawdust like that are borer beetles and the larvae of borer beetles let me fetch you some more there's some sawdust now what is rare, why I didn't immediately think sawdust, is the fact that there's nothing that could make sawdust here. There's no big branch. Wonder if a stick hasn't been kicked away here. Why have you got lots of sawdust here? Where are you getting it from? You know, it's these questions. If you've ever wanted to know what keeps me going out here in the bush, it's these types of things that you're watching me try and puzzle through right now. The fact that there's a pile of sawdust here, sawdust falls out of a hole, a cavity that a, a, a wood boring insect is busy producing and it falls directly below the cavity's entrance, so gravity. In this particular case, there's nothing above us that would give that sort of thing purchase. Except when I start digging, look at that, look at how deep that goes. It's quite obviously sand there. And there, but this sawdust goes into the ground. And I wonder if this tree isn't. It, I wonder if this whole tree hasn't been turned into sawdust. That is just so bizarre. There's the end of the sawdust. I don't know. I'm stumped. I don't quite know what has produced that. If you have any ideas, you're welcome. Send them through to questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag safari live on Twitter. I'll be happy to know what you think this is. All right, nothing on that. 
Why don't we gonna have a, a look at the moth that Jamie has for you? And much like Steph, I found myself stumped in terms of which particular moth species this is. We have so many different kinds out here, but that's been the joy of these live drives, is that I've learned so many new species of moths that have sought refuge in our vehicle. And this particular one came flying in from the rain as we've been traveling along down the southern boundary of Juma and has joined Brian and myself underneath our roof. And I think finds itself feeling quite grateful for the shelter from the rain and from the drizzle. Beautifully delicate thing. You can see the velvet-like fluff all around the top of its head. Immediately, of course, we know that it's a moth, first of all, because it is a quite a drab color. But not all moths are drab. Um, a lot of them are, especially daytime moths. This is a nighttime moth, and I know it's a nighttime moth because of its colors. Um, but the and then daytime moths can actually be incredibly brightly colored and very, very beautiful. We saw lots of fire grid burnets last year on our safaris and we'll see some more this year, I hope. It's also the way in which it's holding its wings is what immediately tells you that it is a moth and not a butterfly. Holding them open like that, a butterfly, whenever it sits, it will... Uh, a butterfly will sit with its wings closed, a moth will sit with its wings open. You can just imagine how this thing, this thing, this moth, would disappear up against the bark of a tree. Can you imagine? It would be basically invisible. And look at those, look at the work of art that are the moth's antenna. So beautiful. I'm going to turn it in a second so that you have a chance to also have a look at its eyes and with this incredible camera of course it gives us a really amazing perspective. I just heard a hippo. Here we go. Have a look at its eyes. Absolutely magnificent. Really really beautiful creature. And this of course is what's so lovely about the rain is it brings out all kinds of unexpected things. Little unexpected moths, creepy crawlies, frogs, tortoises, snakes. I'm hoping we might find some of those along the way. However, one animal that is much larger and probably to be expected is the hippo that I just heard calling. And Marianne, you're wondering where all of the hippos have gone. I don't really feel like turfing you back out into the rain, so you can just stay here if you want. There you go. You can decide where you want to be. Uh, Marianne, it's an interesting one because our, our hippo that we regularly see either at Jumapan or at Treehouse Dam, we haven't seen in days. And we've between all of us, we have all visited the dams at least once, or the water holes at least once, so I don't know where that hippo's gone. There's still tracks in the road in the after when we, whenever we come out on the sunrise safari, because nippo, nippo, hippo of course are nocturnal, so they're only really out during the evenings or in weather like this. Now, there's a massive water hole just to the south of me in Chitwa, it's Chitwa Dam, it's the main dam that's outside the lodge, and that's where I think there are quite a few hippo hiding out. Perhaps our gentleman has decided to move there as well. I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure. It's been, it feels like it's been ages since we last saw a hippo. And I definitely just heard them grunting away. Chitwa is not far. Unfortunately, we won't be able to see it from where we are. But Chitwa is not far away from us at all. And that's where quite a few hippo have gone. Sydney's dam, of course, is dry. That was one of the bigger water holes throughout most of this dry season. And that's nearly dry. Buffles Hook has enough water for a hippo. But we haven't seen one in there for ages. And Voyatilla and Treehouse also, and Twin Dams, all have sufficient water for a hippo to hide out. I'm not quite sure where they've been escaping to. Oh, while we carry on in the drizzly afternoon, I think Brent has got his rain covers on and is out once again. Let's head over to him. Here he goes, a highly mobile Velociraptor. I'm only joking, of course, it's a highly mobile guinea, helmeted guinea fowl and they do look a little bit possibly like a dinosaur with their funny shaped skull and uh, their strange running style. Now one must remember that birds are direct descendants of the dinosaurs and so there's still some of those remnant characteristics left. 
Where did those guinea fowl run off to? Now, I think it was running off to chase another guinea fowl. Now, and it's exactly what he was doing. I'm sorry, we've got rain covers. I just need to reposition so we can see the high action that's happening. So there we go, off they run, there's another one there. Is there going to be a battle? Male on male, at this time of the year, they will separate off into little pairs and the males will violently defend the rights to a female against another male. They do have sharp spurs on their feet and they'll use them to kick each other. Or could the female be tiring of this male and trying to sneak off to another suitor? Oh, the drama out here in the African bush, it never stops. Now we have, as you can see, we put our roof on. There we go. Oh, now watch this, they're actually stripping grass oh, in between trying to keep up with the ladies. So. They are grain eaters, and they'll they'll strip the grass seeds off the different grass species. Uh, they will also eat insects and and things like that. And you can see, oh, funny looking critters. There we go. Off to the next grass seed, or maybe they're just trying to out grass seed each other. Now, now, for me, it looks like if we come a bit wider, you see the one on the left? It's purposely keeping itself between the other male, which is even further to the left. So every time the female goes near, uh, the, there's another one. There we go, off on the left. The one in the center tries to keep, make sure he's between the, the, uh, the male and the female. Now, we've seen lions do it. Now, we've seen guinea fowls do it. And uh, if you go out to your local pub or nightclub, you'll see boys do it. Try and make sure they put themselves between their date and any other potential suitors out there. As much as we are different, we are all the same. Now, I am hoping that there's that male lion who's somewhere close by, who's just been evading me, decides to start calling. Oh, all the birds are having wars today. Coming in, hot. Egyptian geese, oh, being chased by another pair of Egyptian geese. It's bird battles here at the Juma Dam. Oh, and they come. Oh, there, sorry, my, I forgot we got the rain covers on. There we go, there is the victor. He was quite happy, far away from the water's edge, till some other geese wanted to land there. And Ruth, who is in Canada, is wondering what fish species. I'd say at the moment probably none, Ruth. There's a, a possibility that there could be one or two catfish that may have managed to encase themselves in the mud and then they have come out with the rain but I haven't seen any signs of them. Normally you will have uh, catfish or the sharp tooth catfish and uh, tilapia species, normally Mozambique, red-chested tilapia. Now the Mozambique tilapia strangely enough is probably the same as a blacksmith lapwing as well. Uh, the same tilapia you can buy in the US that's fish farmed there, all not quite the same. So the Mozambique tilapia is the best eating out of the tilapias, but it's not the fastest growing. So uh, they've hybridized Mozambique tilapia with Nile tilapia, which are the fastest growing for fish farming. So you have a, a good tasting, fast growing fish for fish farming. So the, both the tilapia species that you eat uh, in the US and you can buy in your local supermarket actually originate in Africa. Now, and Ruth was wondering what fish species. You also get uh, three spot barbs, certain minnow species, and what eats them? Well, lots of things, obviously the kingfishers and uh, 
probably the, uh, the biggest predator of fish is the sharp-toothed catfish. They also eat fish. Leopards will sometimes eat them. Lions, hyenas, fish eagles, and uh, python, certain snake species, or only actually really the python out here, will uh, also feed off uh, the fish in the water. But at the moment, I would say there are no fish there, but they'll be back. Now how, you may ask, when the river is miles away and I'm not going to put them in a bucket and bring them back, what happens is, oh I thought I saw a lion track, it's not, uh, what happens is the eggs of certain fish species get caught on the legs of wading birds and as those wading birds move between different water holes, uh, they will move the fish with them. Isn't that amazing? So often things like saddlewood storks which also eat the fish. Uh, the, the, the main eater of the fish might even be uh, the savior of the fish and moving it into new areas. Okay, now come on, Mr. Lion, where are you hiding? There's the right time of the day for him to possibly get moving. Oh, just before we leave, We've got another bird species for you that was hiding. So, when we were a bit further away, okay, if you zoom in now, and you got, wait, oh, slow down, and just come out a little bit. Okay, there we go, a little bit to the left, down a little bit, center frame, there we go, there we go. You can actually hear some calling. The water thickney. Now, they used to be called in South Africa a dikop, which basically means a thick head. Now, it's not their fault that they were considered stupid. So, they are generally a nocturnal bird species, but they're one of the few ones that don't do so well with car lights. So, especially after rain, they would often be found on main roads and would get hit by cars. And that's because they were blinded and people assumed they were stupid, so their name was a dukop, a thick head, but they actually have thick knees and uh, they are related to the other waders like plovers, but uh, generally will only come out of hiding uh, as it gets cooler and darker. We do see them during the day sometimes. We have two varieties here, the spotted which is away from the water and then the water which is always very close to water. So while we leave this thick need to ponder why it was called a thick head, let's go to James in the tent. We just thought we'd try that. I hope you liked it. Uh, now, <laughs> come over here and have a look under the microscope where there is a gorgeous caterpillar. Now we have our theme of the day is of course rain and rain is what this caterpillar has caught in its little hairs. Isn't that cute? Wouldn't be so cute if that climbed down your shirt, I'll tell you that for free. You'd be very uncomfortable indeed for an extended period. And what it's doing, if I move it slightly, is eating the leaves of this plant. And this plant, I thought for a little while, was the string of stars. I'll just focus in on the flower. I think it's probably from the same family as the string of stars. It certainly looks like a string of stars, except it only has one star and is therefore not a string of stars, but indeed a simple star on its own. A lone star. <laughs> right. Now, uh, once we've shown you this caterpillar, I'd like to show you something that is outside the tent. Are you ready, David? Yes. Here we go. Very nice. Come with me. It's getting very dark out here, ominous. Here is a tortoise. This is a speaks hinged tortoise. I'm not going to pretend to you that I didn't know it was here. I'm also not going to pretend to you that it arrived here entirely by chance. It did not arrive here entirely by chance. It was, um, well, it was just helped along to this point by Taylor, the Fossicker in Chief, and Chief Tortoise Wrangler. 
That is a qualification you can get in South Africa. It's a six-year course at university, tortoise wrangling. So, I mean, it's a very difficult thing. Now, I know we don't normally touch tortoises. We know exactly where this one's come from, though. And we also know that there are puddles and water all over the place. So I am going to pick it up for you. Um, and we have done this and tested it, and it's absolutely fine. The tortoise is not going to panic. What I want to show you is that this is a male tortoise. And what we don't often get to show you is the fact that there is that gap, that very obvious kind of concave um, sort of plastron. It's not a sort of plastron, it is a plastron, that's the underside of the shell. And that concave plastron allows this tortoise to go and find a letty and allows him, when he mounts her, to kind of sit over the scoots of her back, and that's how they mate. The other way you can tell, of course, if I turn him slightly like that, is you can see that the tail is relatively long. It wouldn't be quite as long on at least the tail part of the carapace. wouldn't be quite as long on a female, and that would allow the male access, of course, when they breed. There's one last thing I want to show you, David, and that is that this is the hinge. See the hinge there? Now that hinge is very clearly closed. When it's open, what happens is that this is much bigger and the legs can come out. Isn't that nice? Mm. So that is the Speaks hinged tortoise. David, you're wondering how long a water is a uh, tortoise is able to hold water in its storage pouch. Uh, I don't know, David. I really don't know. I'm going to assume for quite a while, of course, because they go the whole winter estivating without it. And although they estivate, in other words, they shut their bodies down almost completely, they still have to spend a bit of, um, well, they have to drink a little bit of water. They have to absorb a little bit of water to stay alive. So I don't know. I'm going to go with a, a month or two, though, because they really are very good at being without water. Right. We're going to put Tanisha, that's what uh, the tortoise wrangler called this tortoise, ridiculous name, back into its termite mound over there and while we do that Stefan Winterboer has got an eight-legged creature to show you just have a look at what we've got here this is the hole of a tarantula or as we affectionately call them in South African baboon spiders um, and what's happened is this this baboon spider realizing that today has been a particularly rainy day has spun a fine silk covering over the entrance to her burrow and that has collected water and you can see how effective a basically a, a waterproofing that is but I feel that it also allows the spider to come up and drink these spiders are female, the ones that dig holes like this. They sedentary, in other words, they stay in these holes their whole life. They can be up to 20 years old. So 20 years, 20 to 25 years in the same hole, that's a long time. And I think that because these spiders are big and vulnerable, if they had to move away from this particular area, and, be, well, they're big and vulnerable, if they had to move away from the safety of their burrow. But because they're big, I don't think they get all the moisture that they, can, that they need for their bodies from the food that they eat. I think that they're gonna need to collect moisture. And that is one of the reasons for this fine silk web, collects dew, collects moisture. And I think the spider will come up from underneath and drink this dew and drink this moisture uh, after it's rained. That is what I think anyway. I mean, that's obviously has yet to be proven. It's just an observation that I've made over the last couple years but it definitely is I mean it's it's not it's not thick enough to stop uh, anything from getting inside it yes it's a covering I suppose ants wouldn't go inside there a serious ant infestation will definitely chase her out of the hole so maybe it stops ants it's definitely not to catch anything her she has these fine when she's hunting she spins these fine trip lines on the sand that are basically invisible and any large insect that comes along and trips one of the trip lines she then comes out and grabs it and drags it back into the hole to feed on it at leisure basically now one thing I have been looking for over the last couple of days is their refuse bags these spiders similar to us I suppose do a spring clean and they spin refuse that collects at the bottom of their burrows into a bag that they then dispose of at night quite close to their burrows and I'm just looking I found one the other day it was fairly easy to find to be quite honest but since then I haven't found another one so I have yet to find one that I can actually show you so um, 
I don't know, hold thumbs that I'm going to be able to do that soon, at least, anyway. Now, Michael, you've asked me if there's a way to age baboon spiders. There is, uh, Michael. They obviously, when they're born, they're little miniature versions of their, of their parents, little spiderlings about this big. They cluster at the entrance burrows. As they get a little bit older, they move out of the entrance burrow and dig burrows next to their natal hole. So you get a big mommy burrow with lots of baby burrows around them. They then get a little bit bigger. The males start to disperse. The females will move into areas where there is prey available and dig their final burrows there. They, they dig their final burrow when they're still immature. They then modify the burrow as they get older and eventually as they turn into an adult they lose the ability to dig holes. So when you see small spiders that are clustered around the entrance you'd get a gauge of their age. I'm not too sure exactly how old they'd stay there until. It's a couple of months at least anyway. Then at the next stage they'd have their holes clustered around their natal hole. Then what they do is it'd be a small hole that gradually would get bigger and bigger until they turn into an adult and then you wouldn't see any excavation marks i.e. there wouldn't be any sand around the entrance of their burrows anymore and that is when they are an adult. After that it becomes really difficult I would say you'd probably have to yeah I don't know how you'd actually from when they turn into an adult until they die I don't know how apart from size but you'd have to dig a spider up to see really how big it is or entice it out of its hole tease it out of its hole in other words and even then I don't know how you'd sort of uh, age it now, my, uh, Mia, you've asked me, are the male baboon spiders nomadic? They certainly are, Mia, and that is because females are not. Uh, and for uh, mating to happen, the male, who is quite a lot smaller than the female, would wander. He needs to wander away from his natal burrow, away from his mommy and his sisters. And he does that while he's getting older and older. And eventually when he's an adult, and he can actually, uh, when he's able to mate to the female, the hope is that he's so far away from his natal range where he was born, that the chance of him mating with his mom or sisters is much further reduced. And so it's important for male baboon spiders to be nomadic. Mia, I hope that answered your question there about why they are nomadic or are they nomadic at least anyway. So this is a female baboon spider. It is the whole of, the, of a horned baboon spider and I'm making that prediction based on this raised edge. Now Paul, looking at this particular web that's caught this dew, you wanted to know if the web itself would keep out a spider hunting wasp. Um, no Paul, it won't. But I haven't really seen spider hunting wasps go into the burrows of these spiders. Quite often what happens is they land nearby and I think they've got a trick of teasing the spider out. So they pluck on the, the, the snare lines that are around the spider, around the spider's burrow, and that in tosses the spider out and then boom they hunt that spider or they 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 uh, catch that spider in the entrance of the burrow I've never witnessed the spider hunting wasp enter a spider's burrow myself so I think that this web is ineffectual to keep it out but I don't think it's necessary I don't think that that is the function of this particular web or how spider hunting wasps hunt at all anyway now, the interesting thing would be to see how close is the next spider hole. So if there's one spider here, where would be the next one? That would give you an idea of the dispersal range or the prey range of these particular spiders. Um, and by that I mean how much large, how many large insects are in this area to support how many baboon spiders. They're not going to eat the tiny little insects, they eat the bigger insects, the big crickets, the big beetles, um, you know, the softer bodied insects insects around that even kill mice. I know of some baboon spiders that have killed small mice. That's how large they are. This baboon spider is probably about this big. The biggest ones here get about as big as a soup plate, like this big, big teacup size spiders. They really are massive things out here. Right, let's carry on going and see if we can see our next spider hole. But rather than watching the back of my shiny bald head looking for these, why don't we go and see the impala that Jamie has. 
and we have found a lovely mixed herd of impala and it's actually been thoroughly entertaining to watch them and they seem to have stopped doing it now but one of the females that was standing in the middle of the road she got a whole they're all doing it look they get mud in between their feet in between the halves of their hooves <laughs> and they all have to shake it off and it's obviously quite thick mud in this particular patch it's quite clay clay mud and I think it irritates them. I think it's like having mud under your fingernails or between your toes. And every now and again, one of them will stop and give their leg a really thorough shake. Oh, she's she's resorted to using her mouth now. And I think they just find it particularly uncomfortable, which is an aspect of hooves that I have never, ever thought about before. I've never wondered about what it must be like to slip and slide through mud and then find some sort of in between your, the halves of your hoof. And is a problem unique to the different cloven feet antelope and warthog of this area. It obviously irritates them. They're quite fastidious about it. And Impala are actually famously fastidious as it is. They're <laughs> shaking her foot. Their, their teeth are... <laughs> shame. <laughs> their teeth are set loose in their jaw, in their bottom jaw, so that they can groom themselves and use it as a comb and they're always one of the neatest looking antelope of all of them they never look particularly scruffy unless you're talking about males in breeding season but now it's so funny because shame they have they can't do anything about it they shake their hooves and then they step forward and i don't think it's just between the halves of the hoof either because impala are known as are what's known as rim walkers and what that means is that the outside edge of their hoof stinks out <laughs> doing it again. One of them was doing it earlier and her joints were clicking as she was as she was shaking her leg, it was going click 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 click. But yes, they as rim walkers the outside edge of their hoof is more prominent than the inside part of their hoof on each half. So what that means is in hard mud when they leave a track, you can only really it looks like somebody's actually come with a stamp or with a with a cookie cutter, an outline of a an impala track. And I think what's happening is that the mud's not just getting stuck between the halves of their hooves, but also on the inside of the the sort of the bottom of the hoof as well. And it must be a very disconcerting feeling. So of course, much like we do, they're feeling their way with their feet. That must be slippery and slightly almost disorienting as they walk along. If you have a, those of you who perhaps have walked in thick clay mud before, you'll know that feeling. And welcome to Bill. Now, Bill, you wanted to know about when the black spot appears on the rear of the body and what is the purpose. Now, Bill, I'm not sure if you're referring to the, the the patterns on the tail, or if perhaps you're referring to the metatarsal glands, or you might just be referring to the rubbed raw, the sort of the raw patch of skin or the bare patch of skin underneath their legs. And it's a very good question. A baby and Paula are born with the black markings on their tails. And there's a lot of discussion about what those sorts of signs mean. Um, one of the conclusions is that it is a follow me. It's a way of essentially helping the antelope to stay together in a group because black stands out very clearly. And the other theory is that particularly around that area of the impala's body, it is a place where ticks love to congregate. And I was going to show you an impala but we've got some Nyala instead but that's okay we can keep talking about the impala whilst looking at Nyala. i'm sure you can all keep track uh, the 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 black stripes on the back of an impala now that we're looking at the fluffy white stripes on an Nyala, just to confuse matters the other the other conclusion is that they get warmer than the rest of the body because black of course absorbs heat there we go thank you mr impala and that would cause the ticks to spend more time in that area and away from the more tender parts of the particular impala concerned and therefore in a more reachable spot for them to reach back and groom and Baby impala are also born with the black on the back of their legs, which hides the metatarsal gland, the, the purpose of which has been the subject of much argument between various biologists. The predominant theory is that it releases, because it is a gland, it does, the black fur there does cover a scent gland. And the argument seems to be, the predominant argument seems to be that when impala race off away from a predator, of course one of their huge advantages is safety in numbers. And so 
the idea is that that gland will release the the pheromone into the air so that they can actually stay together as a group or possibly find each other again but it is something that's quite unique to impala and it's something that remains a little bit of a mystery now if you're talking about the the dark patch that was on the back of the impala's hock there that's from lying down it's mud and annie Speaking of growth and development of our impala, you want to know how long it takes an impala to become an adult. Annie, it, if you're talking about when they are um, ready to reproduce sexually, if whenever they are sexually mature, for the females you're looking at about a year and a half. So it will be the second breeding season after they are born. They're not ready after the first, which occurs about six months after they're born. So it's the second breeding season when they're about a year and a half old. Uh, the males take slightly longer, although they are also ready to breed at roughly the same age as the females they very seldom have a chance to do so until they're around about four years old and that's because their horns take about four years to reach their full size and a male antelope will actually take four years to really fill out and to build up the strength and the technique that he's going to need in order to mate with a female however Sometimes brains before brawn plays a large role, and I've seen this with Inyala in particular, where a, it's, it's concerned three massive bulls, all three of them of breeding age, and one teenager that hasn't, hadn't even got his, his full dark coat yet. And the three males were so busy and occupied uh, fighting over the females and fighting with each other that they didn't notice that this little interloper snuck in and managed to actually mate with one of the females, even though he was nowhere near ready for that particular stage of his life and nowhere near ready to compete with the, the massive males. So it does go to show sometimes there is a little bit of sneakiness involved and I'm sure the same applies to Impala as well. I'm sure the fact that they're not ready to compete doesn't mean that perhaps they might get lucky every or might not get lucky every now and again. This, this Impala for example in front of us hasn't quite reached the full extent of its horn growth. Nearly. Nearly, nearly. Hello, boy. Sorry, I'm not insulting you. You're nearly at the stage where you're ready. He's got another six months and he's going to start competing. Now, looking at the mixture of the two species, it's a very common mixture that we see out here, the combination of Impala and Inyala. Shelley, you want to know if they ever crossbreed? No, and they can't. They're not closely enough related to each other. So the antelope families are... the antelope grouping is divided into different tribes. I'm not quite sure why it's been termed tribes but it, it is officially referred to as different tribes um, and you get the spiral horned antelope family or tribe which is the Inyala, the Kudu, the Bushbuck and the Elant and then the Impala actually fall in, com in their own, complete own separate tribe. There are no other antelope that are grouped together with them. The more pertinent question would be perhaps do Nyala and Kudu ever interbreed? And again, even within the same tribe, I've never heard of it occurring. It does occasionally happen with other antelope of the similar tribes. So, for example, there was the case of the waterbuck and the lechwe. They're, they're grouped together in a tribe along with the cob. It's been recorded in Hartebeest and Sesebe which again are looped together or linked together by genetics as a tribe. But I think that Kudu, Nyala, Bushbuck are sufficiently different from each other to disallow that. Although, of course, you'll find that they evolved from a common ancestor. But definitely you will never get a mixture of an Impala or an Nyala. Although it would make naming it quite easy, wouldn't it? Imp imp it basically turns into Impala, doesn't it? Perhaps, no. Nya no, it, it is basically an Anyala or an Impala. If you combine the two names, there's no way around it. <laughs> I give up. I don't know what an Impala Anyala hybrid would be. They're hard enough to tell, it, to tell the difference between the two names as it is. All right, it is starting to get very dark. I think we should head over to Steph so that he can say his farewells and head back to the safety of camp. 
It is getting a little bit dark, not too dark, a little bit too dark to start filming without any lights on us and I don't think me holding up a torch on my head full of glycerine uh, is going to make for a very pretty sight. So I think I'm going to take this opportunity to say thank you very much for joining us on the bushwalk this afternoon. I know from myself and Jandre and Herbie we had a really really good time making that little campsite with a cozy fire and playing all the games that we did. But anyway, thank you very much for your support, thanks for your questions as always. and. Uh, on that note, we'll see you again soon, and you're off to Brent uh, to say his goodbyes, I suppose. So these lions are still giving us the slip so far. I've just come back to this area. I've been doing a slow loop. I've been listening. So they're not on the move, and if they are, they haven't been spotted by any other animals, and they're definitely not vocalizing just yet. And I am hoping that that's about to change. I'm just doing a slow loop back towards camp. Just really, really hoping that that, that male lion has got on the move now. Now, the one, the one thing we none of us know where is the Incahumas. They've disappeared. No tracks this morning. Hi, Dan. Dan is wondering, what animal am I hoping to see in the near future that I have not seen in a while? Let's turn the lights off this in part. Dan, it's always, almost always, the African wild dog, my favorite animal. Uh, very exciting creatures, and I'm hoping that they'll make an appearance sometime soon. There's quite a few different groups of wild dogs around at the moment. We can always hope for like May, June next year that the dogs will den here on Juma. They haven't, in my knowledge, in the past, but that doesn't mean there isn't a first time by Impala uh, for everything. Alright, past all the Impala headlights back on. Well, if we don't find the lions, we've always got a f chance at finding some amphibians as it gets a bit darker. You could find some African bullfrogs out hunting for insects. We might find another little bushveld rain frog. I heard them calling when it started drizzling a bit earlier. Meh, meh, meh. That's not a very good impression. But. And I think from what I've heard that we are in for a bit more rain this week. So good for the bush, good for the frogs, and good for the hohos. Uh, if there's anyone new who doesn't know what a ha is, it is a, a very South Africanism. It's like a nunu. It's a little local name for a bug or a, a bug or an insect or a ho ho. Hello, Karen. Karen would like to know what's the most common frog to see after the rain. Well, after or during the rain, the two most common species we see is the, the bushveld rain frog and uh, the African bullfrog are probably the two most common species that we do see. Nothing down there, nope. Mm, temperatures dropped quite a bit. Now, if the lions didn't make a kill last night, tonight is great hunting weather. Quite windy, complete cloud cover. If I was a zebra or buffalo impala, I'd be nervous tonight. Now, while we chatter our teeth together in search of a lion. Let's go to James, who's, who's nice and toasty in the tent. It is like clockwork. You know, temperature drops a little bit. Oh my God, James, he's nice and toasty. Let's go across to James. He's sitting in his tent and he's very warm and cozy. I am very warm and cozy, I'm very happy here. Now, I have something quite dastardly to show you, and before I cast too much aspersion on Brent Leo Smith, he's the one that found this for me. It is, of course, the lucky bean. And this is a creeper that grows on various sort of trees out here. And the lucky bean is not very lucky at all. I'm not really sure why it's called a lucky bean, because it is extremely toxic. It contains a very powerful toxin called aberrin. 
which apparently attacks the um, ribosomes of your cells. So in fact, it can affect just about any cell at all in the body. And what it does eventually causes multiple organ failure, uh, pulmonary distress, neurological failure and death. But only if you eat it. If you touch it, it's absolutely fine. So that's what we've done there. And that is the lucky bean creeper. Very nice. Now, Erica, you want to know if there are any edible mushrooms or fungus here? Yes, there are, Erica, but I don't know what they are. And as I'm sure you know, you don't touch a fungus and put it in your mouth unless you know precisely what it is. This is one of them that I've heard that there are various species of which are, in fact, edible. And this is a bracket fungus. And it's called a bracket fungus, of course, because it, well, it looks like a shelf. You can see it looks like a shelf, and there the shelf would be growing out of a rotting piece of wood. Some of them are definitely edible and some of them are eaten by many animals out here, of course. I'm just not sure how many of them are good for us to eat. They're not very hard to identify. So if you've got a decent fungus book, and I mean, there are many around the place, you can certainly find fungus that's pretty good for you to eat. And you fry it up with some garlic and some butter, and it'd be rather delicious, I imagine. Uh, mushrooms, unlike snails, uh, which you fry up with garlic and butter, actually have a real taste of mushroom. Now, cast your minds back, if you would, back to the guinea fowl sighting that Brent Leo Smith had. He was starting to sound fairly desperate and spoke of velociraptors. It was an odd moment of my life. Anyway, what he did have was those guinea fowls eating this. They were eating the grass stalks. And I don't know exactly what species of grass this is. It's not one that I'm particularly familiar with, but it looked very similar to the one that those guinea fowl were eating. And what they're going for is the seeds. Now, the seeds, of course, are grains, basically. And they are rich in fats. They are rich in carbohydrates. And so they're a really rich source of food for just about any creature, but especially something like a guinea fowl, which is largely a seed eater. There you are. Now you can see there that that looks like, oh, it's just a bit windy, sorry. You can see there, I'm just going to squash it, hang on a second. And, okay, I'm just going to squash it down for you, and then that'll make it a bit easier. There we are, that'll be held. Okay, so it looks a little bit like a wheat sort of sheaf, if you like, and on the sheaf of wheat, the seeds would be a whole lot bigger than they are here. Now, the point of that story is that in Africa, and I've been doing my African research of late, what you find is that there are no grasses that have anything like the size of seed that wheat does, and especially not domesticated wheat now. And those grasses that were domesticated, wheat, barley, those sorts of things are only found in the Middle East. That's where they were originally domesticated. They have seeds far, far larger than these. You wouldn't be able to get sort of a, a bag of flour from the seeds of this grass without many, many tons of the grass. So it's quite interesting to me that that's one of the reasons, of course, there have never been enormous sedentary populations of people in this part of the world because the grasses, and not one of them, is domesticatable out here. And at the same time, of course, not one of the animals are domesticatable out here. No buffalo, no zebra. So I think that's quite an interesting human story around this lot. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Aqua, you want... <laughs> it's a very good question, actually. I wasn't where I thought it was going when, it was, when you said, how does the tent survive? You want to know how it survives animal curiosity. I think it smells like people, and I think that makes animals stay away from it. And we also know, of course, that if you are camping out in the wilderness, which, of course, Steph was about to do, what you find is that animals tend to, I don't know if they perceive canvas as a solid wall or not, but they certainly seem to look at it that way and react to it that way. So very seldom, I mean, a lion could come along here, take its big claw and sort of slice a very neat stripe down the door of a tent and climb in. But you can camp very successfully in a tent in wilderness areas like this and be entirely safe. 
So from a predatory point of view, I just don't think that they see this as something that is accessible at all. I think the elephants probably just couldn't be bothered. They've been all around this tent. They've pulled up gardenia trees. They've pulled up some groovier trees. They've pushed over an enormous Dicrostachus bush outside. So, I mean, they've been around here and they haven't worried about it. The thing that we have to worry about, of course, Aqua, is largely the weather. And the weather is closing in now. So we're going to close the tent up and head across to Jamie Patterson. Thank you very much for coming into the tent with us today. A big thank you to David, who's put in a marvellous effort. Six hours in the tent he's been today, so that was very well done. We'll see you tomorrow at 0500. Until then, enjoy the last moments of this blustery evening with Jamie Patterson. Uh, it has been a relatively quiet afternoon on our side, but Dan, I hear you were talking about which animal you would like to see, um, or which you were asking us which animal we'd like to see that we haven't seen in a while. And I know that Brent answered, I was thinking about ard an aardwolf. An aardwolf or perhaps even a bat-eared fox. It's been a long time since I've had a chance to see one of those animals. Uh, the last time was probably at least two, three years ago, maybe four years ago. It's definitely some of the more fascinating creatures. You could actually, in theory, see an aardwolf here on Juma. They've been seen on the Manuleti before, and Brent swears blind that he found tracks for one once. That's a possibility, but it is relatively unusual. So that's, that's an animal I'd like to see. And black rhino. I haven't seen a black rhino in a while, and I do really, really enjoy them. Brian, what about you? Mm, meerkats. Meerkats. <laughs> so Brent with, went with something that he has, perhaps it hasn't been quite as long since he last saw them, but obviously uh, them being his favorite animal. And Brian says meerkats. And of course, Brian used to work quite a lot with meerkats. Yeah. He used to follow them a lot. <laughs> Ah, and there's another nice suggestion from Sam wanting to know when was the last time we saw a caracal or a serval? The last time I saw a caracal was the time before last, when I was last on leave and I went back to visit where I used to work. I saw a caracal there. And a serval was my first week back at work. So that was what, five, six weeks ago now? Yeah. My first week back after leave and I saw a serval with Dave on Twin Dams. So those two animals I've seen relatively recently compared to my aardwolf experience. Oh, earlier on I asked Brian what he, what he would want to see or what we haven't seen for a while. And then I got distracted by some eyes in the bush and I stopped to look and, and Brian went, hyena! And my hopes shot up. I thought we were going to see a hyena, Brian. I'm so disappointed. But it would be nice to see our hyena once again. Now, Radisha, you want to know if hyena are endangered in any way? <laughs> no, they're not endangered. Um, but, and certainly not in South Africa. We have relatively healthy populations of spotted hyena. But like all of our animals, and particularly all of our predators, they are always under threat from habitat loss in particular. And then, of course, persecution for being an animal that is very, very poorly understood. And they will be persecuted by livestock farmers who don't know any better. So there's always threats to animals like that. Um, they, brown hyena are less numerous, um, but that might also be because they are far more secretive. And a little bit more, um, a little bit more specific about their habitat. So whilst hyena are not endangered in this area, our brown and spotted hyena, an animal like that, a wild, or wildlife I suppose, if we want to go into that kind of detail, but particularly wild predators are essentially under threat from things like habitat loss and persecution. Interestingly enough, one of the reasons behind our vulture decline, apart from this sort of the standard explanation of the fact that they, ha they are used in traditional medicine, there's something there, Brian. Oh, it is a nightjar. Sorry, and it has flown away. I got very excited for a second. I thought it was a, a genet.
but it turned out to be, I just saw the briefest flicker of an eye, it turned out to be a nightjar, and unfortunately, because it has wings, it's disappeared. I'd love to see our hyena again. It would be such a nice, such a nice surprise. But since the Nkuhumas have started moving further and further afield, maybe, just maybe, there's a chance our hyena will come back to us. I certainly hope so. Alright, it is a time for us to call it an evening. The rain's coming down a little bit harder. Hopefully the earth gets a good um, long soak this evening to add some water to it. Uh, for those of you that are interested in having a look at our merchandise, you can join us at shop.wildearth.tv and have a look at some of the things there. Please do have a look if you find yourself with the possibility. The funds that are raised will of course go towards a whole load of new adventures that we can take you along with us in different parts of Africa. And on that note, it is time for us to say farewell. So thank you, Brian, thank you for your wonderful camera work with the Eastian book that we had that ran away and some Impala. <laughs> and thank you to all of you for joining us. We'll catch you on the Sunrise Safari. Bye-bye, everybody. Right, so I was causing a traffic jam, I just had to move out of the road. Of course, with the roof on, I can't really see whether I'm causing a traffic jam or not. Let's just wait, there we go. You can go past. Haha. <laughs> uh, the lion has avoided me. I hate to admit, I was outsmarted by a big cat. Well, let's just say the rain wiped away all sign of him. But I'm pretty sure what's going to happen is as. I get down into camp and uh, sit down, all of a sudden the roar of the male lion will echo across uh, the open plains around Juma. Now the rain is, of course, not the best thing for tracking and finding big cats, but it is incredibly important and wonderful for the African bush. <coughs> and it is going to give us a chance to see some other creatures, such as butterflies and frogs. I thought I heard one calling now, a frog that is. Definitely one of the best sounds to go to sleep to in the African bush is uh, the cacophony of different frog noises, the reed frogs, the leaf folding frogs, the cas casinas, the banded rubber frogs, the rain frogs, the tree frogs, the clicking frogs, the stream frogs, the puddle frogs, the many frogs. Then, as I said, there's, there's quite a few different frog species. We're going to see how many we can get during this wet season. I'm very excited. I really do like frogs. There we go. You can hear the little bush felt rain frog. Wah, 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 wah. But of course, amongst all the frogs, there's obviously going to be a lion or leopard or two. Now, I did hear Karula is down south on, on, on a baby impala kill, so maybe her Hosanna and Chongile snack that quickly and head back to the north, pretty please. I'm sure those lions, I'm hoping the Nkuhumas will appear. What is that? Here's my... No, it is a thing waving in the... I thought it might be a hyena for a, a split second, but it's not. It's about... We are coming towards the end of uh, the sunset safari. We didn't get much of a sunset, but uh, it was still fun. We got to see lots of wet impala and uh, unluckily no big cats. But as you know, on a live safari that can change any second. One male lion could walk around here, but don't worry. Tomorrow morning, bright and early, the, su the safari live crew will be out there, rain or shine, to take you on another adventure.